Hi, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming here on this snowy day to talk about neglected tropical diseases, which might seem a bit remote under this current weather. Um, we're thrilled today to have with us uh, Governor Tommy Thompson as our lead speaker here on the work that he's undertaken as a global ambassador for the Global Network to Fight Neglected Tropical Diseases, and we're also delighted that we're joined by his colleague, Peter Hotez, from George Washington University and the Sabin Institute there, who's played a key role. There's a, um, uh, Peter and Tom, Tommy Thompson have brought to my attention that there's a new editorial uh, that has just appeared uh, in PLOS in January of 09 on waging peace through neglected tropical disease control, a U.S. foreign policy for the bottom billion, and I would urge you all to, to look for that. Um, we initiated this speaker series here at CSIS and the Center for Global Health Policy. We initiated this um, back when we launched the center in September as a forum uh, to try and bring a number of diverse voices that are in leadership positions in different dimensions of global health to come forward and share with us their perspectives, their insights as to um, the, the key issues emerging uh, and, and, and the way forward. Um, this is meant to reveal also the diversity of personalities that have become really deeply engaged in, in leading in this effort. And I would, I would put uh, Governor Thompson at the, t at the top of that list. Um, he served uh, in the Bush administration as the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Prior to that was the longest serving governor uh, of Wisconsin. I believe it was 16 years. Uh, in both of those periods brought about major reforms in approaches on health in the state of Wisconsin and domestically within the United States. And he became, in his tenure as, 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 as Secretary of HHS, a pivotal figure on the international side of things. And I think uh, the most one of the most remarkable achievements, really, was having such a strong guiding hand and getting the Global Fund up and running and legitimizing and validating and getting the board of that fund to function in a pretty remarkably successful way. Uh, we just had here a short while ago um, uh, one of Th Governor Thompson's um, uh, acolytes, deputies, Bill Steiger, was here reflecting on his tenure uh, as the um, senior advisor uh, for international health affairs at HHS and was talking about the Global Fund and about, HHA, about uh, WHO. And um, one of the really uh, impressive aspects of that talk was just how positive and forward-leaning the discussion was about the Global Fund and the outcome of the, of the relationship that has been struck by that. I think this is a, uh, a very important foundation uh, as we look forward on the agenda for this, this administration on global health. We'll hear a lot this afternoon about neglected tropical diseases. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to Peter, to Governor Thompson, to Kari Stover, Daryl Edwards, and the other staff uh, here and the other partners for really putting a spotlight on this and putting a lot of new energy. This is an area which we'll hear more about this afternoon where uh, real gains are possible on a very affordable basis with the right combination of political will, uh, a little bit of cash, uh, and some, some smart implementation strategies. So with that, I'd like to wel please join me in welcoming Governor Thompson to Thank speak. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Steve. Uh, uh, Steve Morrison is, uh, is an outstanding leader. He's, um, I had the privilege of going to Vietnam uh, with him, and we traveled from the north to the south and, and uh, talking about HIV AIDS and how we can contain it. And uh, I can't thank you enough, Steve, for being involved with that project and what you've already done here at CSIS. And also, of course, the most important thing he got is education at the University of Wisconsin. So you, you got to know that he is an outstanding individual and uh, somebody that I'm very proud to know and uh, thank you very much for putting on this lecture series. I want to talk to you today about a subject that is extremely passionate, 
something that I personally am passionate about and something that I think is so important. I'm going to be a little bit broad at the beginning. I'm not going to get to neglected tropical diseases until towards the end of my speech, and then I'm going to introduce Dr. Peter Hotez, who is the number one worm doctor in the world, and um, <laughs> my friend. But I got very much involved in global medical diplomacy, international health. And I want to tell you what I encountered and why I think it would be important for the United States of America to take a whole different tact in regards to foreign policy. I got involved because I, as Secretary of Health and Human Services, I, I wanted to see how we could extend and, and expand the authority, the power, the, the influence, and the support for the department worldwide. And so I traveled a lot. And uh, uh, several individuals who are in the room, Ann Peterson uh, for one, um, my friends in the front uh, aisle here who uh, were very much involved with me in setting up uh, the Global Fund or being involved in that. And a lot of people have a tremendous lot to say about it. But what I want to tell you today is what I experienced and why it changed my philosophy and changed my life and why I think it's so important for America to get involved in this. And that is global medical diplomacy. I went to um, Africa on a trip, and uh, some of the individuals in this room were with me. And we went there, and we went to Botswana, a country where 38% of the people were infected with HIV. A country of about 3 million people, a little bit less. A beautiful country. But a country was destined to fail unless we got involved. We then went to South Africa, and Tony Falci was with me, and we went to several, Dr. Falci, who is really is the number one research scientist for AIDS in the world, and he was with me, and we went to this, we went to this orphanage that had just been started about a year before we got there. It was started by the Jesuits, uh, a priest, and we went there, and we were there, and there was approximately 70 children between the ages of six weeks to five years. It was a new orphanage just to set up for children that were HIV positive. And I'll never forget this. I was there, and I held this little three-year-old girl, and she looked up at me with those beautiful eyes, and all she wanted to do was to have somebody hold her and love her and say things were going to be okay. Hank Kimmel from uh, Pfizer was there, and I asked him to pick up a baby boy. And he picked him up, and, and Hank is a, a very rough uh, uh, businessman and very direct. And I could see him holding that baby boy, and I could see the tears come down his eyes. And he, after we left, he pulled out his personal checkbook and wrote out a check so that they could expand the orphanage. I tell you the story because when I left there, I, on the way back from, <clears throat> from Africa, I turned to Tony Falci and I said, this is something is really bad here. And he says, yes, there is a medicine called nomorphine. Uh, how do I pronounce it? Novarapine. And <clears throat> novarapine, and it will prevent the transmission of HIV from a mother to a child. And the country of South Africa, with well, the Minister of Health, was opposed to it. And I told Tony Falci on the way home on that plane that we had to develop a plan. And we developed a plan, and we took it to the president. And he not only accepted that plan, but he expanded. And he expanded it to the PEPFAR program. But it was started on that trip to Africa. And the President, uh, President Bush's uh, legacy is really going to be built around what took place on that trip because the PEPFAR program was a direct result of that. And allowing the United States of America to invest in 16 countries worldwide 
to hold down and try and to prevent HIV. Uh, it was a, a wonderful thing. And right after that, we got involved with the United Nations, and uh, Kofi Annan came down to see me and asked if I could be present when he met with the president, and also if I could support a new concept, a concept called a Global Fund for Fighting AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. We started out with just a concept, and President Bush was generous enough, and as president, he suggested that we put in the first $200 million. It was $200 million that really started the Global Fund. That global fund uh, then went on and we got uh, several countries to contribute. And we started out with an idea and a few hundreds of millions of dollars. And I was lucky enough to be the chairman of the board for three and a half years. And we went from an idea and a concept, ladies and gentlemen, to a fund that went from nothing to $5 billion in about 18 months. We had programs in over 127 countries, and we had over 200 programs. It was an absolutely huge success. And it was for the first time the continent of Africa really felt that the United States and Europe were concerned about the plight facing people in Africa. There was a whole different concept, a belief that people really cared about what was taking place in Africa. And we grew that fund, and that fund has been extremely successful. I don't know of any corporation in the world that ever started out with an idea that grew to $5 billion in less than two years. And now it's over $8 billion. We're now in 135 countries, and we have over 300 programs helping to prevent AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And for the first time, people think we can are going to be able to contain HIV. They think we have a chance maybe to really reduce and possibly even eradicate malaria and be able to control tuberculosis. Fantastic successes and great dreams. And then I went, after I was the chairman of the board, I took a group of 104 leaders from all over the world to go and visit Africa. I had individuals that were people in government from Europe, from America, senators and congressmen, religious. We had people from the United Nations, the World Health Organization, UN AIDS, all came on this trip. And there were so many huge eagles in the plane when we took off from Germany that the plane didn't use any gas once we got up. It just levitated all the way to Africa. We got to Africa, and we went to several countries, and we went to Uganda finally. And in Uganda, I made every person on that plane spend a day in a village with somebody that lived with AIDS. And we had to go out. We left Kigala at 4.30 in the morning because it was a three-and-a-half-hour hour trip on a bus. And we got out there. And we got to a little community called Tororo in the, in the state of Busia. And it, this clinic that was run by CDA, CDC actually administered to 650,000 people. And we had to get on little motorcycles, Yamahas. And I ride a Harley. That was the only downer in the trip. I didn't have a Harley. I had to get on one of these other kind of... Uh, second-rate motorcycles, but we had, to, we had to take the motorcycles out into the village in order to see the people. And I had my daughter, Tommy, with me, and she'll, she'll never be the same because of what that trip meant to her and how it influenced her life. We went to the first person that I was there with, and a woman by the name of Rosemary. And I went there, and I saw this woman. And she told me her story. And I expected to see this African lady that would be very decimated and very sickly because she was supposed to have died in 2001. And when I was there, I instead found this wonderful, beautiful, ebullient African lady. And she told me her story. And I'll never forget this. 
Her husband died in 1994 with AIDS, leaving her with three children to raise. And next year, in 1995, her brother died, who lived right next door, leaving her with four more children to raise, plus an elderly mother. And because her husband owned the land, but in that tribe, the land didn't go to her, Rosemary, it went to her husband's brother. And so she had to pay rent on these two hectares, which is about five acres. And she got $70 a year. And she was on her deathbed from AIDS in 2001 and was supposed to die. And they had already built a crypt to bury her in. And then we started delivering antiretroviral drugs. And when I was there, which was in 2004, I met this lady who was active, running the family with seven children. And she lived in this mud hut with two rooms, one for the children and one she lived in. And she invited me in and was so happy. And I talked to her and she says, Mr. Secretary, I want you to go back to America and say thank you to America, to the President, to Congress, and to the people, and to your department. Because what you did, you gave us the drugs and you allowed me to live. And by allowing me to live, I'm going to be able to raise these seven children. And they will not become part of the 12 to 14 million orphanages that live in sub-Saharan Africa. And that was powerful. And I went back and I met the 104 people and I said, ladies and gentlemen, we have got to start a movement in America on global medical diplomacy. And that global medical diplomacy is what I really want to talk about today and then get into neglected tropical diseases. Because it is so powerful. And I traveled to 37 countries. And in all the countries I went to, the women, the government leaders were always looking for what they could do to promote good health. And I went to Afghanistan four times. And as all of you know, the women in Afghanistan were treated just like chattel, probably worse than the, worse than the pets and the animals that the individuals kept. Women could not go to school. They could not uh, practice medicine, could not do anything. And women, if they wanted to go and, and see a doctor, they had to go to a male doctor. They had to bring their own sutures and their own bandages because the hospitals didn't have it. And this uh, one place in Kabul I went in, and I noticed that in this hospital, in all the hospitals, there was no running water. So that if a woman had to go in and get a cesarean, they'd have to bring a male doctor in and start doing the cesarean without scrubbing up. And all of you would know the infection and the death. 16% of the children die before in childbirth. One-fourth die before age five. And it was the worst, second worst country in the world for maternal death. And I came back and I talked to the president and Condi and, and Don Rumsfeld. And I said, we have to do something about it. We have to build a hospital for women and children. And so I raised $2 million, and we went back and remodeled the hospital just for women and children. And I went back there on Easter Sunday, 2003, to open it up. And in the auditorium were 700 women, none of which could understand my language. They were not invited, but they came for one reason, and that reason was to say thank you to America and thank you to me for being there, for building a hospital for women and children. And that was so powerful. And I looked out and I said, if you really want to win the world war on terror to the hearts and minds of women in those societies. And the same thing happened in the tsunami. And since the tsunami, prior to the tsunami, Reuters did a poll in Indonesia. 75% of the people polled said that they disliked or hated America and Americans, and 25% were favorably disposed. And you know something? The tsunami came in America. But this generosity sent money, and we in the department sent a ship called Mercy. 
a hospital ship with volunteer help. And the ports of Jakarta and so on. And they spent six weeks there with volunteers. And the day the ship left, there were thousands of people down on the port waving American flags, saying thank you. In the next month or so, they did another poll. The poll was just the opposite. Seventy-five percent of the people polled were favorably disposed to America, and 25 percent were still opposed. A tremendous shift, a paradigm shift in that country, all because of global medical diplomacy, a word that I coined. And I decided that looking at these examples, we have these two giant ships, one Mercy and one the Comfort. One's in Baltimore and one's in San Diego. Modern ships that are giants. They're larger, they're as large as three football fields. And they have enough beds in there with modern equipment. You can do brain surgery, you can even do transplants. And we got them here, and I thought to myself, what a tremendous opportunity for America if we would allow these ships to sail around the world with young medical school students that are just fresh out of medical school, be able to go into these ports and be able to administer the needs of individuals. Can you imagine a giant ship floating into a poor country, the port, and getting out with young idealistic men and women fresh out of medical school to teach and to administer and to take care of people? It would be the biggest public relations coup that America could ever have. And that is the kind of foreign policy that I envision, that I believe medical diplomacy is where we can really make a giant step forward and not have to go to war. Medical diplomacy is so much power, more powerful and so much more lasting than bullets in Iraq or Afghanistan or in Africa. And that's what medical diplomacy is all about. And now getting to neglected tropical diseases. When I left the government, I still wanted to be involved because it's a passion of mine, as you can tell, to do something. And Dr. Hotez and Carrie Stover came to me and says, we have another situation that is probably broader and probably affects more people and actually can be controlled easier than AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And it's called neglected tropical diseases. There are 14 of them. And there are seven main that, are, that really afflict 90% of the people. And when you consider there are worldwide, there are 6 billion people that live there. And 1 billion of those individuals have a neglected tropical disease. And that you can administer to those individuals for only 52 cents a year. When I tell that, people come up and say, I'll take three, I'll take five, I'll take ten. But for 52 cents, you can cure these diseases. And I was in Rwanda in August with Jason Denby, was in Tanzania in November and December, and I saw what we could do. One billion people afflicted by neglected tropical diseases. Ascariasis, trichoriasis, hookworm, schistosomiasis, onchocerciasis, trachoma, and lymphatic filariasis. And all of these afflict and affect the poorest people in the world. People that make less than $2 a day. And individuals that either their minds have been somehow stymied, their growth has, and we can change that and allow these people to have a better quality of life and be able to have an opportunity to make a decent living. 
because these diseases are disfiguring, they're disabling, and they put on individuals that are afflicted with them a, a sort of a, an attitude they can't be any better. And they're sort of looked at in their villages as people that are unclean, like leprosy. And they're all based from worms. When we were in Rwanda, we met with the president, President Gagami, who was doing a wonderful job, and he organized the military, the schools, the university, the villages, the education department, the health department, and he went out to vaccinate, deworm, and give family planning to five million, one half of the citizens in eight days, and we accomplished that. And in eight days, we vaccinated and dewormed over five million children and mothers. And everybody was compelled to come to a central place in the village, either a, a clinic or the school, and we were there. And I'll never forget it. We went around, and the children were so happy to know that somebody really cared. And I'll never forget this young man who came up, and he was about the size of my five-year-old granddaughter. And he was 16 years of age, and he had an extended belly. And you could run your hand over that belly, and you could feel the worms going up and down the, the wall of the stomach. And by giving him two pills twice a year, that is taken care of. But that child is going to be stunted for the rest of his life, but he still has two more years to regain some of that growth, but he has not been able to learn in skill in school. And just by the amount of medicine that's given to us by the pharmaceutical companies, the opportunity to deworm and vaccinate these children, we can really change the quality of life and the quality of health of villages all over. And that's what the fight for neglected tropical diseases is all about. And what we're here today is to enroll and enlist and hope that you will travel with us to Africa or the Caribbean. We're pretty much taking care of neglected tropical diseases in America, even though there are outbreaks every once in a while in some poor areas. But it does so much good. So much good for the world, so much good for those villagers and, and individuals. And it does you so much good. And that's what America is all about. And you can do this through medical diplomacy, whether it be AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, neglected tropical diseases. And that's why I'm so happy the CSIS is putting on this program so we get a chance to get this information out. And it's for 50 cents contribution. You can buy enough medicine to treat one person for a year. Isn't that amazing? And there are one billion of those individuals in the world that need that help. And so I think it's a cause that's worth fighting for. And the beauty is we actually can eliminate all of the 14. None of the 14 need to be there. They're all worm-based. And that is why I wanted to bring my partner, my friend, and the number one worm doctor in the world, Peter Hotez, to come and talk scientifically and medically about neglected tropical diseases. Peter Hotez is a, runs the Sabin Institute which, of course, most of you know, was started by Dr. Sabin for polio. He also is a distinguished professor of medicine in worms at the University of George Washington. He's going to receive a high honor very shortly. And I'm going to have the privilege to introduce him, I hope. But he is a, he's one of those individuals that has absolutely dedicated his life to really bringing change and making this world a better place. So with that, I introduce my friend who used to be six foot six when he started in this quest, and now is the size that you see.
because he's worked so hard and has carried so much weight. He has shrunk down to the size he is right now. I give you my friend, Dr. Peter Hortez. It's given new meaning to the term heavy lifting, hasn't it? Um, when I agreed to appear with Secretary Thompson, I thought we had the understanding that I wouldn't have to follow him. So he's, he's the hardest act in the world to follow. So uh, I hope, it, so we kind of reverse things. We put the Rolling Stones ahead of the Warm Up Act. Uh, but I uh, hope you'll bear with me. Um, I'd, I'll try to be uh, brief uh, and just give, go through a few slides, a few PowerPoint slides to give you kind of an overview of why these diseases are so uh, absolutely important. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank my good colleagues at the Sabin Vaccine Institute, uh, Aaron Hoffelder, uh, Karen Palacio, Suzanne Levy, uh, Chloe Cooney from the Endeavor Group, uh, Lydia DeGrazia from George Washington, and of course uh, Jason Denby uh, for their help in uh, uh, putting this together. And, and Dr. Morrison, thank you so much for giving us uh, this very distinguished venue to talk about uh, these conditions. If I could get the lights down a little bit in the front, that would be a big help because the slides are kind of dark and they're not easy to see. So when we talk about uh, these neglected tropical diseases, we're really referring to the most common conditions of, for want of a better term, the bottom billion, a term that uh, was partially coined by Paul Collier, the Oxford University economist, to refer to the poorest people in the world who live on no money, live on less than a dollar a day. The World Bank has changed that a little bit. Now they say there's 1.4 billion people who live on less than a dollar 25 cents a day as the new criteria for the poorest people. It's not quite as poetic as the bottom billion, but you, you get the same sense. So these are, it turns out, the most common infections of the bottom billion. And most people have never heard of these diseases, even though the evidence points to the fact that these diseases in aggregate are as important as AIDS or malaria or TB, better known conditions, and yet um, uh, few people have heard of them. So the most common infections of the bottom billion, uh, all of them are infected. Let me just give you the quick laundry list of, of the seven most common. They include the, the one that uh, Secretary Thompson referred to, Ascariasis, the large common roundworm. So those of you who worked in developing countries will recognize this child or a child like it. It was a picture taken by one of my students working in Haiti, where the child is stunted for height and weight. He's got a big belly. And indeed, you could run your hand over the surface of his abdomen and palpate the outline of these uh, intestinal worms. 807 million people, mostly kids. Essentially, all of the kids of the bottom billion have these worms in their intestine. Uh, same with trichuriasis, which is one of the problems is the pronunciation. He did a great job, uh, Secretary. Um, is, a, is the whipworm, which are, which are in the colon, hookworms in the small intestine, which cause blood loss, 600 million, extraordinary uh, numbers. Schistosomiasis, which are flukes that live in the uh, blood vessels uh, and uh, cause uh, blood to appear in the urine and the stool, 207 million, 120 million with lymphatic filarial worms in the genitals and lymphatics, uh, 84 million people with trachoma, which is the only non worm neglected tropical disease, or NTD, uh, on our list, uh, which is a huge cause of blindness. And same with river blindness, or onchocerciasis, also a huge uh, cause of blindness. So the first point is there are a lot of people with these uh, parasitic worm infection, neglected tropical diseases. The other is that now, uh, through a series of uh, uh, studies that have been conducted all over the world, when we look at them in terms of disability, uh, not so much in terms of death, but in terms of ability to ruin lives using a metric, which is sometimes known as the DALI, the Disability Adjusted Life Year, the number of healthy life years lost, either from premature death or disability. These neglected dis tropical diseases in aggregate are as important as HIV AIDS or malaria or TB, uh, the better known condition. Uh, but they also do something which is very interesting. They have the ability to not only occur in the setting of poverty, but they actually promote poverty. And they promote poverty because, first of all, uh, most of these neglected tropical diseases, most of which are worm infections, actually impair physical growth. The more worms you have, the more stunted you are. They not only impair growth, but they ruin IQ. The more worms you have, the greater your loss in IQ is. The more worms you have, the greater your loss in memory and cognition. 
So as a result, the more worms you have, the worse you do on your uh, tests of educational performance and school attendance. And now uh, Hoyt Bleakley, who's an international development economist at the University of Chicago, has done a study to, to indicate that chronic hookworm infection in childhood reduces your future wage earning capacity by 43%. So these are the stealth reason why the bottom billion can't escape poverty. It's because they're too sick because of these chronic worm infections. So this huge impact on uh, intellectual and physical development in children. An important impact on pregnancy outcome. These are not just pediatric diseases. Uh, as I'll show you a slide in a minute. Essentially one third of pregnant women in sub-Saharan Africa have hookworm. Why do women get sick in childbirth? Primarily because of bleeding and blood loss and anemia. These are major underlying causes of anemia and result in poor pregnancy outcome, meaning higher maternal morbidity and mortality, but also low birth weight. So these are why, why kids are being born premature and stunted when they're, from the day they're born is because of hookworm and schistosomiasis. A very imp huge impact on worker productivity. Remember, these are the diseases of the subsistence farmers and their family, people who are just raising enough crops uh, to support their family. Chronic lymphatic filariasis, one of the very important NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, uh, causes $1.5 billion in economic losses in India alone every year, 88% reduction in agricultural productivity in Ghana. So these are actually keeping people mired in poverty. They not only occur in the setting of poverty, but they're promoting poverty uh, as well. Uh, this is just one example uh, that I could use to, uh, we could have spent a whole day talking about why these neglected tropical diseases uh, destroy lives. This is just an example of the impact on maternal health. Uh, it was picked up by Don McNeil in the New York Times uh, recently, who uh, we reported that one third of pregnant women uh, have hookworm. Incredible numbers if you think about it. Seven million pregnant women uh, with hookworm infection, 44 million pregnant women with uh, hookworm uh, worldwide. Now, we're here today to uh, not only talk about poverty, but because we're at CSIS, we also want to talk about uh, the uh, implications of these diseases in terms of uh, global uh, diplomacy. And so Secretary Thompson and I uh, have written a paper, which is now uh, just got published today. It's on the uh, uh, Public Library of Science website, so it's an open access journal. You can go to plos.org uh, and just uh, and find that paper. And what we've done is to uh, identify not only the impact of these neglected tropical diseases on destroying health and destroying poverty, but a very interesting observation showing how these neglected tropical diseases actually seem to promote conflict. So I'm going to come back to the slide in a minute, but I just wanted to show you what we found was this uh, curious overlap for a number of neglected tropical diseases. They occurred in the hot spots of the world where you have uh, conflict. Um, what we found is a very interesting relationship between uh, the two, is which I'll talk to you about now. So first of all, you can uh, overlay, overlay maps of the two. Uh, that's one. Uh, on the bottom right is one of these important neglected tropical diseases where we've looked in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Angola, Central African Republic, and Sudan, and uh, where in the 1930s we had very high rates of infection. Uh, through aggressive uh, tsetse fly control in the case of sleeping sickness, we brought levels down to close to zero. But then, uh, because of all of the conflicts that were occurring in, in those four countries that I just mentioned, we're, we were for a while back up to 1930s uh, levels. So a very intimate relationship between uh, conflict and neglected tropical diseases. Now, the, now the, the point of this paper is that, that things go both ways. That not only do neglected tropical diseases emerge in the setting of conflict, but it may work the other way around, that they actually promote conflict, one, because they're so incredibly destabilizing. So first of all, they have an important role, a pivotal role in the world's food crisis. And the reason for that is essentially when you're feeding kids, you're feeding the worms, because these worms compete for the host for uh, nutrients. And as a result, a lot of the effort that's going into for agricultural development is actually like pouring money down the drain because it's uh, being taken up uh, by the worms. A huge impact on re reducing uh, education and future wage earning, which is another way they promote uh, uh, instability, they promote ignorance, and very importantly is community destabilization. So as rates of 
lymphatic filariasis go above a certain point in an endemic village in Africa or India, or as a rate of onchocerciasis, river blindness, goes beyond a certain rate. What we find is that l rates of agricultural productivity decline dramatically, and at the same time what happens is farmers abandon their fields. They're forced to because the rates of the infections are so high and so endemic. So as a result, they'll abandon their fields to go to uh, less uh, fertile ground. And so there's this, there's this horrible uh, synergy between reducing agricultural productivity and abandoning the fields. So these are just uh, where, uh, to impress upon you some numbers, these are all sort of uh, country hotspots that uh, Secretary uh, of, of State Hillary Clinton will be concerned about uh, in the coming administration, Angola, Central African Republic, DRC, Somalia, Iran, Burma, Cambodia, North Korea, Colombia, Haiti. One of the things they share is that they have the highest rates of neglected tropical diseases uh, anywhere else in the world. Uh, in some cases, 70, 80, 90, in a few cases, 100 percent of the, of the poorest people living in these areas are, uh, are chronically infected. And that's an important point about these diseases. These are not acute infections like you get a, with, a crop, with a common cold. When a, where you have them for a couple of weeks and then they resolve. When people have these neglected tropical diseases, unless they're treated, they harbor these infections for years, frequently decades, frequently the entire life of the individual. These parasites have managed to le learn to live a long time uh, in, the, in the intestines and in the, in the blood vessels uh, of these individuals. So uh, the, we're looking at a situation where people are affected for years and it has these long-term effects. So uh, what we have found is uh, how uh, lands are abandoned in sub-Saharan Africa, how, uh, how lymphatic filariasis festers among ethnic minorities in Burma, uh, leishmaniasis in gorilla areas of Colombia, guinea worm in the Sudan, and then uh, the, the ubiquitous hookworms, schistosomiasis, uh, river blindness in Sudan, Central African Republic, DRC, and Angola. That's the bad news. The good news is that uh, at our global network for neglected tropical diseases, and we're very proud of our little worm in the globe uh, over there in the upper right-hand corner, we have, uh, with our partners, uh, which include m most of the major public-private partnerships working in the developing world, I developed a package of drugs that can simultaneously target the all, all of the seven most common neglected tropical diseases. And quite interestingly, the drug companies are donating these drugs uh, with the exception of a couple which are available as low-cost generics. So that's an example where the drug companies are actually the good guys. So Merck is donating ivermectin, uh, GlaxoSmithKline is uh, donating albendazole, uh, Pfizer is donating uh, azithromycin, and we can put these four drugs together to, in a package to simultaneously target the seven most common neglected tropical diseases, and as Secretary Thompson said, we can do this for 50 cents a person per year. So imagine taking on the most common infections of the bottom billion, which in aggregate produce disability as high as AIDS, as high as malaria, but instead of doing this for hundreds of dollars a year for antiretrovirals, or $50 a year for direct observed therapy for TB, or even $10, $20 a year for anti-malarials and bed nets, we can do it for 50 cents a person per year. What's more is that th by distributing these drugs, uh, several of our partners, like the African Program for Onchocerciasis Control, has mobilized an army of 470,000 community drug distributors, volunteer community dr uh, drug distributors that are delivering the package. What's really neat now is we hand them a bed net to go along with it, and the use of anti-malarial bed nets goes up ninefold, uh, uh, which uh, was published uh, a couple of years ago. So that now we can piggyback all sorts of interventions onto this neglected tropical disease rapid impact package, not only the ne neglected tropical disease drugs, but childhood vaccinations, vitamin A, anti-malarials and bed nets. It, it's really a great story. So we've got treatment programs now uh, going on in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America. We are uh, going to announce uh, in, a, in a few days uh, a major initiative uh, that I can't sp uh, uh, say too much about that's going to be uh, supported by uh, some of our investors. But the point is that even without large-scale investments, even with small-scale investments, we can go a long way. Uh, a, a school child, someone in high school, can donate 50 cents and make a huge impact uh, on the life uh, of an individual. Uh, finally, I'll end here. The other part of the business of the Sabin Vaccine Institute is we not only deliver drugs, but we also develop new generation products for neglected diseases. 
one of the problems that we're having with hookworm, a very important one, is that we uh, think we may be seeing the beginning of drug resistance, so we think we have to develop a vaccine. So one of the things that we've done now is to create uh, an organization that, uh, uh, with laboratories at George Washington University that's actually developing a, a new first-generation recombinant hookworm vaccine, which if you think about it, scientific hurdles aside, which I won't go into today, you can imagine the economic challenges of this, trying to uh, make a product for, that's guaranteed to fail financially because by definition, if you, you only get hookworm if you're a member of the, the bottom billion. So this is almost like a guaranteed money losing company based here in Washington. We can't call it that, of course, so we call it a product development partnership, but it's basically a guaranteed uh, money losing company. And the reason I bring that up in this context is that there's an additional opportunity for medical diplomacy that goes beyond uh, 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 delivering treatments, and that is joint re medical research opportunities. Very few people are aware of it, but that the, the oral polio vaccine that many of us received as children was actually developed jointly by the Americans and the Soviets at the height of the Cold War. So what happened was uh, 1956, or shortly after Sputnik, the Soviet Union was developing, was having massive polio outbreaks. Through back-channel diplomacy, Soviet virologists came to Albert Sabin's laboratories, which were then at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, Sabin got permission from the State Department to go back to Russia with those polio strains and jointly developed the oral polio vaccine, which was tested on 60 million Soviet school children before it was uh, uh, brought back to the U.S. for licensure and then widely deployed uh, throughout the United States. So it's a great example of how two uh, uh, diametrically opposed countries, you can imagine what it was like in 1956, uh, on both sides would put aside their ideologies for purposes of uh, joint vaccine development. And so we're also very interested in looking at the possibilities of how we can apply that model uh, today to uh, some of our countries uh, that uh, we may not have the very best diplomatic relationships with. So uh, I'll stop here uh, just to uh, ask you to join our fight for the global network. Uh, let's go to globalnetwork.org and learn more about the countries in which, uh, where we work. We've created a loose change initiative, again, 50 cents a person per year, and we're hoping to uh, uh, really make this a very important global health uh, priority issue over in the next uh, few years. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you, uh, Secretary Thompson, for your enormous uh, support. We'll take uh, Peter, Dr. Peter, and myself will take questions uh, from anybody in the audience on uh, global medical diplomacy, neglected tropical diseases, uh, global fund, or anything else you would like to talk about. And uh, I just would like to, uh, one conclusion uh, uh, that I would like to point out uh, one point is that uh, uh, for a half a billion dollars, $500 million, we could absolutely strike a blow for freedom on neglected tropical diseases. And uh, that, is, that is how big the problem is, but how we can actually achieve a, a victory in this field. Questions? Go ahead. Sam Rizman with the um, Congressional uh, Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health. Uh, my question is to Dr. Hotez. Uh, you were mentioning briefly uh, res drug resistance, and I was wondering if you had concerns about uh, a program that would implement a wide um, you know, lots of drugs into to an area, and then if that area descended into uh, civil conflict, uh, those drugs would be unavailable. Is that sort of ebb and flow of drugs? Did that worry you in terms of uh, building resistance to them? So the answer to your question is yes, it worries me, but not as much as uh, some other diseases. One of the reasons is these worm infections are very slow, slowly replicating, so that the likelihood of resistance is inversely proportional to the replication time. So this is not like a virus like HIV or even a malaria parasite. Uh, which is rapidly replicating. So the time frame for resistance to develop is extremely slow. So uh, we've been, you know, at, at the only one drug after some 15, 20 years in uh, fragmented ways of being used and with lots of interruptions is some evidence now of drug failure from mebendazole. So we're concerned about it. We think, you know, an important part of the message is to continue to innovate, continue to develop new products. 
but uh, the over, but but certainly not withhold these drugs for this theoretical risk um, to deny access to these essential medicines. Obviously, would be a huge moral and ethical failing. Uh, Dr. Cortez, I'm Dave Tarantino with the U.S. Navy and on a, currently on a fellowship here. I'm wondering if you see any of the NTDs as good candidates for eradication either in a given locale or a region or even globally. So that, that's an excellent point. So the question is, of these seven, do we stand a chance to actually eliminate? We don't tend not to use the word eradicate as much, but eliminate as a public health problem. Uh, certainly the two that look very promising our lymphatic filariasis and trachoma. So for instance, now in uh, many middle income and so lo some low income countries, when we've gone through two to six rounds of the drug used for lymphatic filariasis, which is either ivermectin donated by Merck or diethylcarbamazine, which is available for 0 0.4 cents a tablet, four to six rounds, meaning once a year, every year for two to six years, we've now eliminated those diseases in at least 12 countries. So, and in, 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 in now it looks Egypt like it, it might be close as well. So that's very exciting, to, that, which is something that you're never going to do with HIV AIDS, you're never going to do with malaria, you're never going to do with TB, actually eliminate these diseases. Morocco just became the first country to eliminate trachoma, and we expect uh, others to follow as well. So for at least those two, we have a great prospect of eliminating, with the others making a big Im impact in terms of control. Secretary. Yes. Uh, yeah, the agenda for Cook from CSIS. Um, my question was uh, it sounds like to administer these various drugs, uh, you don't really need the health <laughs> infrastructure that you might need for HIV and malaria or the health professionals and that community trained uh, pr professionals can administer. Is that, am I getting that right? And is there a question of kind of the storage and the supply of the drugs um, in terms of you know, shelf life and that kind of thing? Yeah, the, the drugs are very stable. They're also very safe, in addition to being very inexpensive. And you're right, these are, we're, talking, we're not talking about an antiretroviral that you have to administer every day. We're talking about once a year. Uh, but having said that, now that we've got these, there is some degree of training required, not a lot. But now that we've got this army of community drug distributors, we're starting to think, you know, maybe this is really capacity building. Now we can fold in other interventions. And I think there's going to be a lot of parallels, particularly with malaria and the opportunity to add anti-malarial bed nets, artemisinin in combination therapy too, uh, with these community drug distributors in place. So it, it, is, there are, it is capacity building, absolutely. Um, it, it varies, um, you know, days, you know, a couple of sessions. It's, it's fairly simple, partly because the safety profile is so high for these drugs. Uh, Christine Lubinsky, Infectious Diseases Society of America. A question for Governor Thompson, actually related to the Global Fund. Um, as I'm sure you're well aware, the latest round of funding for the Global Fund has had to be delayed for lack of resources. And notwithstanding the tremendous progress made through PEPFAR and the Global Fund, there is a tremendous amount of work still to be done on HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, and many of us are worried uh, about the obvious. Uh, we're in the middle of a worldwide economic crisis. Um, a tremendous amount of time and energy and money are going into trying to get us out of that domestically. And at the same time, we have tremendous commitments overseas in developing countries, and many of us would like to expand our work on HIV, TB, malaria, as well as the important neglected tropical d diseases. So I guess I'd like your thoughts on um, whether you think uh, the U.S. Uh, commitment to these diseases as well as the neglected diseases under discussion today is sustainable, can be expanded, and, and how, you know, what are your thoughts about how we can make those arguments both to the new administration as well as to a very worried Congress interested in bailing their own states and communities out? <clears throat> I certainly hope so. Uh,
the truth of the matter is, is that it is such a tremendous investment in foreign policy to, to fight these diseases. I, I had the privilege of, uh, of being on the board of the World Health Organization, and the African countries, the ministers of health, were so pessimistic about their future and their country and their whole continent prior to PEPFAR, prior to the Global Fund. And the Global Fund and PEPFAR changed their attitudes and, and changed, you know, the dynamics in, in the whole continent of Africa that people were concerned, and it was so important. And just like my examples in Afghanistan, I mean, if you really want to win the war in Afghanistan, it's through, uh, it's through changing the, uh, the minds and, and hearts of the people there. And, and medical diplomacy is a lot cheaper than building bombs and, and tanks and so on and so forth. So uh, granted, we have to have a strong military. But if you really want something permanent, the fight for the hearts and minds of people in various countries that don't particularly care for us, I think it's through health care. And I think it's through medical diplomacy. And it's such a wonderful investment. And it's, it's so long lasting. So uh, nobody knows what's going to happen with this recession and downturn. It's, it's, it's serious. And we all know that. And it's global. And anytime you go into a recession like this, countries, you know, uh, hunker down and they don't give the contributions necessary. But I could make a, a very valid argument and will to anybody that will listen that this is not the place to cut. This is the place to expand. And it's cheaper and it's a long-term investment in the future of, uh, of our country and the world. And that, to me, it's worth the expenditures seven days a week. I think the analogy we gave is for the cost of two F-18 fighters, we could take on the neglected tropical diseases in all the, in all the conflict countries of Africa. So the add-on cost is, is trivial, and the impact is, you know, think of it for an extra 5%, an extra 2%, you can double your impact. For $500 million, we could have a fantastic victory in the field of neglected tropical diseases. And, and uh, Peter's right. Uh, I used the example. There was a, a, <coughs> a uh, development called the Apache. It was a, was a airplane that was being, uh, being developed. And the United States of America has, was committed $32 billion for it, and after an expenditure of $8 billion, they scrapped it. And I thought to myself, my Lord, for $8 billion, <laughs> give, me, give me half of that, and I can win the hearts and minds of a, of a whole continent in Africa with, uh, or uh, Indonesia or whatever. And that, to me, is, uh, you know, I think we get our priorities a little bit mixed up. My question is for Secretary uh, Thompson. Some of the country, especially in Africa, affected by neglected tropical disease have been friend of the U.S. since the 60s. And some of those countries have U.S. Uh, embassy, have USAID program. What are you suggesting now? What would be different from having U.S. embassy, USAID development program in those countries? Well, I, I think the I think that's happening. We, uh, Jason and I, just came back from Tanzania, and um, the ambassador there, Mark Green, uh, was fully involved in the fight on AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. And he went out with us out to the villages. Uh, the Minister of Health uh, of Tanzania was with us, and I was there on a Sunday. And uh, people from CDC and from USAID and from uh, other federal departments all came out on a Sunday. I mean, uh, and uh, to see me, I can understand when I was secretary, but I'm nothing now. I'm just uh, just Tommy Thompson, and they came out to see me to to tell me what they were doing, and they were absolutely committed. Uh, to organizing village by village and getting the, the medicines out to, to people, whether it be antiretroviral drugs or the drugs to defeat neglected tropical diseases. And what I, what I really found is the attitudes of the ministers of health of the African countries. They, 
they have changed completely, and they are looking for ways that they can work closer in cooperation with uh, American departments and American uh, agents to, to really do this. It is a, it's, it's wonderful to see because I've been involved in this now for eight years, and I can remember back eight years ago when you wouldn't find that cooperation. And I can remember when USAID wouldn't have anything to do with the Department of Health and Human Services. And I can remember when they were all fighting over the turf battles. And I can uh, remember when the, the Global Fund was uh, resented by some people in the federal government and, uh, and so on. And that all seems to have dissipated. And there's a, you know, I'm sure there's still some of it there, but uh, the, the degree of harmony in country along with uh, in-country in the United States with the uh, people and the embassies there and with the federal uh, departments in that various country or in the various countries has just been heartwarming for me to see and see the tremendous progress is being made. Great progress. doesn't mean that uh, we don't have a long ways to go, but there's been great progress in the last eight years. Sir? Secretary, what is the status about intellectual property rights and the issue of development? Because about 10 years ago, I was in Korea when the Institute of Vaccine was uh, established internationally, and we just opposed it. And uh, basically, that development was focused on the needs of tropical countries, and the pharmaceutical industry was not willing to focus on their needs. Uh, I, before that, I was in India, uh, basically as a science officer with the State Department in both places. Uh, this was always a big problem. It's always, it always has been, and it's, and it continues to this day, but much less so. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry made some terrible mistakes about six years ago, when they brought a lawsuit in several countries in Africa, and that was. You know, that was probably one of their dumbest moves ever uh, because <laughs> it turned the whole world against big pharma in America. Uh, but since that time, uh, big pharma has, in the case of neglected tropical diseases, you know, we, everything we ask for pretty much is given to us. You know, you can't administer these drugs for 50 cents a person for a year without the generosity and the charitable giving of, of pharmaceutical companies because the drugs cost more, but they're giving them to us at cost or giving it to us, uh, you know, as a, as a contribution. So the intellectual property rights, you've got to have intellectual property rights for, for scientists, biotechs, and, and pharmaceutical companies to develop new drugs. And, and everybody knows that uh, these drugs have a, a life cycle in which they the viruses and the bacteria grow stronger and you have to come up with new medicines and you have to find medicines you know for new diseases so you have to have intellectual property rights but I I find that there's a much more harmonious feeling in the world uh, towards pharmaceutical companies much more giving and contribution and much more sharing not enough of the sharing but uh, it's it's getting much better and I'm, I'm very happy about that, and I think it uh, goes a long ways towards uh, getting the drugs to people that need it in Africa and other sub in some other countries. You know, you know I, I should just, just to reinforce what he just said in that uh, the issues regarding intellectual property for the neglected tropical diseases, I won't say are zero, but they tend to be much less acute than other global health problems. In the sense they're not dual use in the sense that these are not diseases that occur at all in the U.S. or Europe and Japan, so there's there's no military, and there's not even much of a military market or a, a traveler's market, because you only get these diseases when you're living for a long time in these developing countries. So, um, you know, we, for, we're for we funded for our hookworm vaccine by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They ask us to put forward a global access roadmap, which includes a detailed discussion of intellectual property, primarily, and they put that into place for things like AIDS and malaria, where there are both U.S. And, and developing uh, country markets, it's really not so much of an issue. We like to say if some guy in India wants to copy what we've done and vaccinate all of India, well, then God bless him. You know, we're, so we, so we, we file patents. We're often not sure why we do it.
couple quick observations and a question. One observation is that it seems that when you talk about river blindness and guinea worm, you've got two fairly dramatic success stories of the last period with fairly complex partnerships involving Carter Center or, or uh, pharmaceutical companies and different agencies and the like. And yet it doesn't seem to, those success stories don't seem to translate in the popular mind too much as powerful examples that prove the concept. And why is that? So that's the first point. Is there more to be gained by, the, by, by looking at those stories? Second is, you didn't really talk much about China and India. When you put the figures up, it wasn't emerging, it wasn't emerging, large emerging countries that were the focus. The focus was really the most broken of places. Uh, the numbers that you put up for DRC, or for Angola, or for Cambodia. Those are the places where you've got really deep concentrated problems and the obstacles are really formidable. Um, and so maybe that's part of the problem is trying to convince folks that neglected, neglected tropical diseases should be, should be a priority within a, a broader global health strategy, um, which gets to my last point. Where, if you were to, Peter and, and Governor Thompson, if you were to identify the small subset of states in Africa or outside of Africa, where you think the biggest gains could be made by a concentrated investment in the next five to ten years in order to prove the point that you can have big gains on six or seven of these, what would those be? Mm -hmm. What would those countries be? Because I doubt that you'd get much traction by saying DRC and Angola. You can't ignore those countries. There has to be an investment. But you're going to get a much better, bigger payback here in Washington in a, in a constituency around this by picking, picking three or four that are more co that Rwandas or Tanzanias or Ghanas, where you're going to be able to make dramatic gains. And what would the strategy look like in your mind? Thank yeah. you. Well, you asked about th three questions, and, I'll, and, and the, the answers could be quite long-winded, but I'll try to <laughs> just summarize a few points. First of all, with regard to guinea worm, you're right, it's a great success story and the Carter Centers and, and our partners, including WHO, have taken this on. It's worth pointing out that at its worst, Guinea Worm had 3.2 million infections worldwide. So what we're talking about now is something much more ambitious, hundreds of millions, a billion people. So I think the Carter Center provided important proof of concept that with the political will of the president and, and, uh, and WHO that you can make a big impact on a disease now we're going to go after the big one, the, the, the one that's hundreds of millions. With regard to the distribution of middle and low-income low countries, you're right. These are diseases in India and China and Brazil, uh, but I should mention they're only in the very poorest segments of, of those countries. So uh, they're very unevenly uh, distributed. So you don't go into Beijing or Shanghai and see these diseases quickly. You have to go into Yunnan province and Guangxi and uh, in parts of Sichuan province, Hainan province, the real poor rural areas uh, for you to see them. Regarding where do you begin, um, I think you're right. The, the conflict and post-conflict countries are the most daunting. Um, uh, it wouldn't be our tr if we wanted to go out, start with a home run, you wouldn't necessarily pick DRC, which is half the size of the United States, and uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to work, work there. So that we, the global network has identified a list of uh, priority countries, uh, but we don't shy away from conflict or post-conflict countries necessarily because even there, our community, the community drug distributors have been working there and have, have, have had some great success stories in, in places like Sudan and Angola as, as well. So we have a priority list, but we haven't totally written off the conflict or post-conflict countries yet. I would, uh, <clears throat> I would only add to what Peter said about the uh, the countries that we can have the biggest impact on, you got to realize that certain certain groups in the Congress and uh, around Washington D.C. that are really individuals that can influence power uh, are individuals and groups that have certain attachments to certain countries. Uh, Rwanda is a big one because of the genocide and. Uh, uh, Rwanda is one that you're going to have huge success in uh, just because the, the 
the government is stable and there's a great deal of uh, sort of remorse in America that we didn't do more in the genocidal period. And so that's one immediately that jumps out. South Africa, you know, we haven't uh, uh, dwelled much on South Africa, but South Africa's Minister of Health, you know, really didn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, do as much as uh, they should have in fighting AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And now that administration has changed, the Minister of Health has changed, much more active and much more involved, which in South Africa is always one that has great support in America. And that one has got uh, tremendous opportunities to improve, especially in AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Zimbabwe, you know, as soon as if ever Mugabe ever leaves, which uh, it can't go on forever, he's 84 years old, and uh, he has destroyed that country. And uh, that is, as soon as they have a change of leadership, you're going to be, uh, I think, somewhat shocked by the amount of capital that wants to go in and help out Zimbabwe. Botswana. Uh, is a, a country that uh, is fairly wealthy. It's got a lot of natural resources, and it's a small population. It's a huge country, uh, very diversified, but it's got great, great opportunities to improve the health care because they have a government that wants to, to influence and change. Tanzania is another one. Uh, you know, Mark Green, when we were there, and it was just an amazing thing to me. Uganda. Uh, Uganda is a, a one that I would think is uh, just ready to be helped uh, even more so. So those are the countries that I would think of. But I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give up on the Congo because the Congo, uh, who's the basketball player? Dikembe Matumbo. Matumbo is uh, building a hospital there and is really developing a great deal of, uh, of following. He wants me to go with him this summer, and I, I hope I can. Christopher. Christopher Williams, Georgetown University. Uh, you talk about treatment of individuals who are already infected, but what kind of preventative measures are you taking that are non-chemotherapeutic to prevent infection? So that, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I should mention that the, the medicines, even though they're treatments, we sometimes call them preventive chemotherapy because, for instance, the drug for lymphatic filariasis doesn't directly treat the individual it lowers the number of circulating microfilaria required for transmission, so they actually interrupt uh, transmission uh, in that particular instance. Uh, for trachoma, we uh, also recommend what's known as the SAFE strategy, which includes simple surgery in addition to the antibiotics and, and environmental control. Clean water and sanitation are the mom and apple pie of global health. Um, they can be extremely expensive uh, interventions. Uh, what we have found is that when you use sanitation alone in the absence of economic development, it has a very minor, trivial impact on reducing uh, the prevalence of these diseases. And um, whenever possible, we encourage clean water and sanitation, and the World Health Assembly resolutions all support that as well. But it can be very expensive and very costly. But it's a great question. This, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to introduce a young naval doctor who is with us. Andy Baldwin is in the audience. How are you, Andy? Thank you. You're going to be fine. I'd just like to say thanks to uh, Secretary Avanello and Mercy and Ron and the Comfort this summer for uh, the power of medical diplomacy is huge. I wish people would go out and see it more. And the fact that uh, the CNO and the Commandant have made America, have made medical diplomacy a primary component of our American strategy is just huge. You got a question? Go ahead. <laughs> now I'm really on the hook. I'm Judith Kaufman. I'm an independent consultant. I was privileged to work with Secretary Thompson on things like the Global Fund. Um, and I want to ask you something on global medical diplomacy. As you know, I come from the State Department, so the other side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And your thoughts on how diplomacy itself 
the State Department, the more traditional tools of foreign policy, can be engaged in promoting global health? First off, not only did you assist me, you led the way. You and your husband were absolutely at the World Bank and with the setting up the Global Fund. Her husband was, uh, uh, was my candidate to run the Global Fund. We didn't win, but, uh, uh, but uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was an ambassador and just a fantastic American. Um, I think the State Department has got to be much more aggressive. Uh, you know, they, uh, you, look at the, you look at the maps and you see the, the need out there. And uh, with Secretary Clinton now, with her notoriety, she could just be a, a world leader, a, a role model for trying to transform the State Department into leading with medical diplomacy. And I think President Obama wants to get away from the militaristic uh, type of uh, things that are taking place in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what better place than to try something new? It's like, it's like the Marshall Plan all over again. And uh, you could rebuild the Marshall Plan only use medical diplomacy. The ships, uh, the Global Fund, the President's PEPFAR program. And President Bush's legacy is really uh, the strongest part of his legacy is going to be what he did in, in medical diplomacy. And uh, I, uh, I'm very happy that I played a small role. I'm very happy, Kaufman, that you were there helping to lead the way. And the State Department could make uh, the Obama administration, you know, the, the foremost leaders in global medical diplomacy if they want to lead. And to me, it, there's... There's, there's just no down, uh, downturn in the opportunities for that. It just, uh, it's just an upward uh, opportunity for this administration as it was for the Bush administration. Uh, it was interesting. I just got to give you a little factoid. Of the, <clears throat> of the seven countries in the last eight years that like America the best, all come from Africa. All come from Africa. You know why? It's the President's PEPFAR program. It's a global fund. It's medical diplomacy. Now, if you would ask that on a quiz, I bet 90% of the, of the people that you would ask that would say that's not true. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, at the statistics and the polling, seven of the ten countries that value America the most is Africa. And that's strictly because of global medical diplomacy. And if you really want to win the war I mean, I, uh, on, on terrorism, I'll say it once again, it's through the hearts and minds of women and children in these countries. Because no matter, of the 37 countries I visited in four years while I was secretary, uh, there was one common denominator. And that common denominator was good health for themselves and their families. And that, you know, is... Uh, permeates throughout the whole society. And that's why global medical diplomacy works, can work, will work, and should work, and is the way that I think the State Department should change in order to try and attract more information, more resources, and more development in that area. The good news is the uh, Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases was launched at the Clinton Global Initiative in 2006. And uh, uh, next to Secretary Thompson, the only two political leaders who know almost as much as about neglected tropical diseases as President Clinton and Secretary Clinton. So hopefully that, that will make a big impact. 